share with people at the end. But for now, I just want to tell you the story about uh, this wonderful piece of history that happened a century ago that in a way it feels like we're reliving now only somewhat differently. So uh, can you see and hear me okay, Eric? Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about Connecticut and the Spanish flu epidemic or pandemic of 1918 and 1919. The last time Connecticut found itself in this uh, absolutely unusual and somewhat surreal situation. The influenza pandemic of 1918 and 1919 was the most disastrous onslaught of infectious disease in Connecticut since the epidemics that devastated Native American tribes in the 1600s. With 115,000 recorded cases and 9,000 deaths, the Spanish flu took a greater toll on the people of Connecticut than any war before or since. This year, the economic and social disruptions of the COVID-19 pandemic in Connecticut are greater than those of a century ago. But so far, at least, our statewide isolation and social distancing practices have kept the mortality rates and caseloads from COVID-19 significantly lower than they were in 1918. As of the most recent report, and I'm using last Friday's data, uh, Connecticut's have suffered 78,000 cases of COVID-19, two thirds of the number afflicted with the Spanish flu. Similarly and tragically, 4,671 Connecticut's have died from COVID-19, but that's only just over half of Connecticut's death toll during the Spanish flu pandemic. Of course, you know, we all know and we're seeing the daily increase. We're at the start of a fall winter surge, so the comparative numbers are sure to increase. But if you also consider that Connecticut's population today is two and a half times larger than it was a century ago, it's quite clear that the 1918 flu epidemic in Connecticut was a first order tragedy. Like the coronavirus that causes COVID-19, the 1918 flu was a new and much more virulent version of a disease well known to Connecticut's. The state's first officially recorded cases of influenza, which people then commonly called the grip, had hit the state in 1889 and it caused only four deaths. But after that, periodic bouts of the flu had spread sickness across the state in 16 of the 29 years preceding the 1918 pandemic. Influenza wasn't at that time tracked as a reportable disease. That is a disease so dangerous, its progress uh, had to be closely monitored by public health officials. But it did have a significant impact on annual death rates, especially in the two years prior to the pandemic. Significant, but nothing like the disease that arrived at New London's Fort Trumbull at the beginning of September, 1918. The United States was at war and New London was a hub of the American war effort. Home to a new submarine base, a naval training station, the headquarters of the Cutter Service we now call the Coast Guard, and a transfer port for Navy men heading abroad to serve in World War I, New London was teeming with young men who it turned out would be primary targets of the new flu strain. The first cases of the flu surfaced at the Fort Trumbull Experimental Station on September 1st, when several US Navy crewmen from ships recently returned from the war in Europe came down with the chills, backache, terrible headache and coughing, symptomatic of the disease's onset. The men were sent for treatment to New London's recently activated U.S. Naval Hospital. Shortly thereafter, cases appeared among personnel at the U.S. sub base at Groton, then back among civilian employees at Fort Trumbull, where the first cases had broken out. By the 10th of September, nearly 100 flu-stricken seamen, the sickest of whom were so oxygen-deprived that their whole bodies turned a deep, purplish hellbore blue 
had been admitted to the Navy hospital. That same day, more than 300 military men arrived at New London State Pier from the Boston Navy Yard, where the flu was already raging and the city's fate was set. More than 7,000 seamen were at that time crowded into temporary quarters in the homes of New London's civilian population. So the disease spread rapidly from sickened sailors throughout the community. By month's end, New London had 900 cases of a disease that seemed nowhere near peaking. Unlike the COVID-19 coronavirus, which entered Connecticut from the New York City area and then spread north and eastward to the rest of the state, the 1918 flu pandemic followed a nearly opposite path. From its start in New London, it spread northward into Norwich and the cities and towns of eastern Connecticut, then west to Hartford, the New Britain region, and from there south to New Haven, Bridgeport, and the rest of Fairfield County. The Norwich Bulletin reported on September 14th, the epidemic of grip, which has been prevalent in the eastern states in New England, has struck into Norwich, New London, and the vicinity with considerable force. The paper urged people with symptoms to call their doctor immediately and insisted that anyone ill should be kept isolated. The disease is the most contagious form of grip, it said, and every means to prevent the spreading of this disease should be taken. But spread it did, following the automobile routes into the interior out of New London, to Wyndham, Putnam, Vernon, Rockville, and Hartford. Aided by the visits home of infected but asymptomatic soldiers on leave from Camp Devon in Ayers, Massachusetts, it also reached Wallingford, Hartland, and Danbury. Ultimately, with the exception of just a handful of rural Connecticut communities, every city and town in Connecticut was infected, and from 30 to 40 percent of the state's population caught the virus. Since the disease had appeared to enter the United States with military men returning from Europe, most people believed the source of the pandemic was Spain, one of the neutral nations in World War I. And the country also believed to be the source of an earlier flu pandemic in 1893. The 1918 pandemic's identification with Spain came about because the Spanish press had widely reported the influenza outbreak in their country, while Europe's warring nations, for reasons of military security, had kept news of the disease tightly under wraps. America had only heard of a flu outbreak in Spain, so they naturally assumed that Spain was the source of the disease the returning doughboys brought with them. Recent research, however, has shown that the 1918 influenza might better be nicknamed the Kansas flu, as it first appeared in military bases in Kansas in early 1918 among troops who were about to be deployed to the European front. American troops not only took the disease to Europe with them, they later brought it back. And the disease that killed so many Connecticans in 1918 and 19 though called the Spanish flu, was an American import. Between September and January of 1918 and 1919, excuse me, between September of 1918 and January of 1919, the state rolled through the state in two waves, east to west and north to south, and it peaked in different regions on different dates. New London County saw the maximum number of new cases on October 2nd, while Fairfield County reached its peak on October 23rd, three weeks later. The first wave of the disease was by far the worst part of the epidemic. Over 90% of the 115,000 reported cases and 7,600 of the 9,000 influenza deaths occurred before the end of 1918. The late December, January second wave, though deadly, had a much smaller impact. October of 1918 was by far the worst month of the pandemic, and it proved to be a public health nightmare. 
80% of the total caseload and nearly 60% of the fatalities occurred in that one month. Public health officials realized the gravity of the situation early, declaring influenza a reportable disease throughout the state on September 18th. Local and state public health departments, as well as many of the state's wartime defense agencies that had been created to help marshal state resources to support the World War I effort, immediately shifted their focus from fighting a war in Europe to fighting a war on the home front against a new and deadly viral disease. Instituting statewide infection control and social distancing measures was a primary concern. Using press reports, pamphlets, posters, placards, and leaflets by the thousands and tens of thousands, widely distributed by local health departments and Red Cross chapters, the people of Connecticut were barraged with messages telling them how best to protect themselves from the flu and what to do if they got it. In one such message, Connecticut's were provided a simple nine-step approach to keep from catching the disease. One, don't inhale any person's breath. Two, avoid persons who cough and sneeze. Three, don't visit close, poorly ventilated places. Four, keep warm and dry. Five, if you get wet, change your clothes at once. Six, don't use drinking cups or towels that other people have used. Seven, for the protection of others, cover your mouth when you cough or sneeze. Eight, clean your teeth and mouth frequently. Nine, don't spit on the floor. Posters tied flu prevention measures to the war effort. Help, the, help fight the grip, Kaiser Wilhelm's ally, warned one. It added additional preventive measures to be followed, including get fresh air and sunshine, avoid worry, fear, and fatigue, and avoiding crowded spaces, especially street and trolley cars. Those who had caught the flu were given instructions on how to keep from giving it to others. Stay at home on the first indication of a cold. Don't receive visitors while sick or recovering. Don't leave home until after all symptoms have gone. Don't sneeze, spit, or cough in public places. And don't hesitate to complain about careless coughers and spitters. Both the State Department of Health and the Connecticut State Council of Defense worked together to urge people to do your bit to stop the grip. How effective such measures were varied from place to place, depending on population density, community organization, degree of industrialization, cooperation among local businesses and industries, and other variables. Willimantic, which had experienced one of the highest rates of sickness in the state, reported on October 10th, the prompt action of the town and city authorities in combating the influenza epidemic, together with the assistance of the American Thread Company and the cooperation of the general public, has already led to an improvement of conditions and a retarding of the spread of the disease. The day before, however, the Bridgeport Times, which was experiencing the full force of the viral onslaught, had declared voluntary social distancing measures a near total failure. It required only a glance at sidewalks and gutters this morning to show that spitting is more prevalent than usual. In the theaters last night, other observers noted hurricanes of coughing. The warning signs have disappeared from many trolley cars. The overcrowded trolley car appears to be one of the most dangerous points of contagion. In morning and evening cars, men and women were packed in like sardines. One of the first and most important questions public health officials faced was whether to close schools and other public gathering places such as churches and movie theaters. Though it recognized that attendance at public gatherings renders one most liable to contract the disease, the state health department nevertheless elected not to order the closure of schools. Schools should not be closed, they wrote, 
as experienced in nearly all epidemics, has shown that pupils are safer in a well-ventilated school and under the observation of teachers than when schools are closed and the children allowed to intermingle in homes and upon the streets. If it were possible to keep school children at home, State Department of Health Commissioner Dr. J.T. Black wrote, there might be some advantage in closing the schools, but experience has shown that when schools are closed, the children visit each other's homes to such an extent that the object in closing the schools is rendered practically nil. Teachers, Black said, could render great service in controlling the disease by monitoring children as they entered school and sending home those who showed signs of illness. The state took a similar stance in regard to theaters, arguing that the entertainment provided by theaters has a good psychological effect upon the human system and tends to raise the resisting powers of the body against infections, state health officials said they would not close theaters, provided, however, that theaters displayed a series of three slides on their movie screen before every performance. The first slide would say, the health authorities will close this theater unless spitting, coughing, or sneezing is omitted during performances. This slide was immediately followed by the second, which read, sneezing and coughing in this theater may spread influenza. Be fair and stay home if you have a cold. The third slide read, if you have a cold, retire now. Do not endanger health of others and save yourself embarrassment. If, despite these warnings, sneezing or coughing still occurred, the show was to be stopped and a fourth slide put on the screen. The person sneezing or coughing will please retire now in the interest of health and those sitting near him. So a little public shaming in the interest of safety. Places of worship were also allowed to remain open, though ministers were urged to become part of the state's disease education program. The state asked pastors to explain the nature of the disease to their congregations and to impress on their parishioners the need to refrain from coughing or sneezing during services. Pastors were urged to ask those who did cough or sneeze to remove themselves from the sanctuary. Even the state's undertakers, already overwhelmed by the surge in demand for their services, were included in Connecticut's social distancing efforts. On October 10th, they were informed by officials that funerals were to be strictly limited only to relatives of the deceased and those necessary to conduct the services. In addition, to prevent wakes for the deceased, no chairs were to be set up in funeral homes during visitations. Funeral directors probably welcomed these restrictions as they were facing an unprecedented workload. Waterbury experienced a coffin shortage during the pandemic. Elsewhere, cabinet makers took up casket making to help address the state's critical shortage. Though the state in principle opted for keeping public gathering places open, it recognized that local conditions might render their closure necessary, and so they left that as a local option. During the height of the local outbreaks, many communities overrode the state policy. Faced with overwhelming disease pressure, New London, for example, closed all schools, theaters, churches, dance halls, bowling alleys, and other public gathering places on September 25th. Danbury closed its schools on October 4th, its theaters the next days. Small towns such as Moosop also shuttered their theaters as they saw the cases overwhelming local ability to respond. The state's medical community, which had furnished many physicians and nurses for the war effort overseas, was from the start understaffed and overwhelmed. Community after community found itself with not enough hospital beds for those who needed them and not enough doctors and nurses to treat those who filled the beds they had. The state responded to this medical crisis a number of ways, commandeering country clubs, barracks, dance halls, parish houses, 
high schools, and even private homes, it set up more than 30 emergency hospitals across the state, not just in cities such as Bridgeport, New Haven, Hartford, and New London, but also more rural towns such as Winstead, Canton, Thomaston, and Stonington. On three separate occasions in October, the State Department of Health issued calls to physicians and nurses from Connecticut who had taken higher paying nursing jobs elsewhere to answer their home state's call to service. You are needed in Connecticut to help overcome the influenza epidemic, the first call to nurses read. Don't leave your home state folks to die while you seek a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow somewhere else. Whatever effects such pleas may have had, faced with a pandemic of 1918's proportions, the response was insufficient. On October 16th, the state began seeking untrained women to volunteer for nursing duty. Bridgeport's public health officer put out a call asking simply for women with courage and common sense. A knowledge of nursing or medicine is not necessary. Relentless in its quest for assistance and experiencing the highest disease pressure of any New England state, Connecticut was able to enlist the services of 48 physicians and 101 nurses to serve for various periods of the epidemic. They came from federal agencies like the U.S. Public Health Service, private agencies such as the Red Cross, and from private practice. A substantial minority of the professionals were volunteers assigned to both the regular and the emergency hospitals and to helping the ill but unhospitalized they helped the state get through the worst single medical crisis in our history. In addition to searching for medical personnel to treat the disease, Connecticut participated in the quest to find a cure for the disease. In the midst of the epidemic, doctors from Tufts Medical School and Boston University developed a vaccine they hoped would be useful against the pandemic. Over 4,000 doses of an anti antibacterial vaccine were administered at industrial sites and in state institutions where the effectiveness of the vaccine could be monitored. Despite the developer's high hopes, however, the vaccine had no influence on either preventing the disease or moderating its effects on the afflicted. Scientists would not determine definitively until 1940 that influenza was caused by a virus and it wasn't a bacterial infection at all. Newspapers during the pandemic were filled with both information and disinformation. Some, especially in the early days of the outbreak, seemed to have intentionally downplayed the flu's dangers in an effort to calm readers' fears and prevent panic. The Norwich Bulletin, through the first 20 days of September, dutifully reported the seriousness of the pandemic in Massachusetts while generally ignoring its spread at home. Similarly, the New Britain Herald reported under the headline, Quigley Sick, Not Spanish Influenza, that the city's mayor, George Quigley, was ill and at home, but just from ordinary old-fashioned grip and not the fear-inducing Spanish flu. The intent was clearly to allay fears about the pandemics reaching their city. Most Connecticut papers, however, including the New Britain Herald, followed the plant pandemic closely once it hit their towns with full force. Advertisers, especially those with remedies to sell, were quick to capitalize on the contagion. The makers of Oil of Hylamel, for example, ran an ad that looked and read like a regular news story with the headline, Health Board Gives Warning of Influenza, Ask People to Take Proper Treatment Promptly. The ad described the symptoms and many dangers of the influenza in detail, but then it noted, probably no better or more effective treatment could be followed than to get from the nearest drugstore a complete Hylamel outfit consisting of a bottle of pure oil of Hylamel and a little vest pocket hard rubber inhaling device into which a few drops of the oil are poured. This is all you will need. Put the inhaler in your mouth and breathe its air deep into the passages of your nose, throat, and lungs. 
every particle of air that enters your breathing organs will thus be charged with an antiseptic germ-killing balsam that will absolutely destroy the germs of influenza. Another product that came into its own during the 1918 pandemic is still a widely used cold therapy today. Vicks VapoRub, a cold relief compound formulated by a druggist in North Carolina and originally marketed as Vicks Magic Croup Salve, used the same pseudo news story approach to triple its sales to nearly $3 million a year. When VapoRub is applied over throat and chest, one of its many ads in the Bridgeport Times stated, the medicated vapors loosen the phlegm, open the air passages, and stimulate the mucous membrane to throw off the germs. Such medicines, like the medical treatments of the day, may have offered comfort and reassurance, but they did little or nothing to blunt the impact of a pandemic that raged through Connecticut for five awful months. In the end, after the second wave of the flu subsided in the spring of 1919, a battered state was left to assess both the pandemic's impact and its social, psychological, and economic costs. 115,567 Connecticuts had contracted the most virulent form of influenza the state had ever seen. For 8,907 of them, the disease had proved fatal. This was more people than had died in the war in Europe. And ironically, many of the Connecticuts who died of flu were in the same age group as the men who died in combat. And as in COVID-19, the victims were disproportionately male to the tune of 58% of the afflicted. One of the compounding tragedies of the 1918 pandemic was that unlike COVID-19, which disproportionately kills older members of the population, the 1918 epidemic focused on the very young and the old, and especially those in the prime of life. More than half of the influenza fatalities were among people between the ages of 20 and 39, and their loss compounded the demographic, the demographic tragedy of World War I's deaths. Cumulatively, these losses challenged the state to reconceive of its future as one with a measurably smaller group of its most productive citizens. In 1918, Connecticut experienced its highest death rate in 40 years. In the wake of the influenza epidemic, more than 3,000 children lived in homes with only one parent. Another 200 were totally orphaned and nearly all required some kind of social service support. The state's wartime boom economy also faltered, transitioning into a post-war economic recession, a collapse from which it would recover only to join the nation in facing the Great Depression of 1929 and after. Psychologically, no one forgot their experience of the pandemic. For those afflicted, the memories were most painful. At 83 years old, Joseph Camp of Hartford remembered being an eight-year-old hospitalized victim in Hartford saying, nurse, nurse, I'm sweating, and being told, you're supposed to sweat. Most painful was his memory of coming home after he recovered, going into his house and saying, where's Ma, where's Ma, only to be told by his sister that their mother had died from the flu. Sister Alexine McCullough, who lived in Bridgeport during the pandemic, at age 85 vividly remembered running into the house whenever workers heading for the Remington Arms plant would pass by for fear she would catch the disease from them. Today, as we once again watch the disease numbers rise and re-entered a modified lockdown, waiting for the new normal at the end of our era's pandemic, we can perhaps gain some solace from the knowledge that science is giving us the tools that will hopefully keep this pandemic's death rate, though truly terrible, lower than its predecessors of a century ago. And also, thanks to today's report from Pfizer and Groton, 
that we can look forward with confidence to a vaccine that will blunt the force of this new and terrible infectious disease. Like the 1918 flu pandemic, the coronavirus has changed everything. But like the 1918 flu pandemic, it too will run its course. So thank you, that's, that's my story. And um, I have, I, I was, unfortunately I ran out of time to put together a PowerPoint, but I do have some slides I could show you uh, of some of the images and some of the newspaper stories from the time. Would you like to see them, Eric? Won't take but a couple of minutes. Yeah, okay, let's do it. Excellent, I'm gonna share screen. Okay, so Eric, can you see that? Yep, you're in the clear. Okay, excellent. Uh, what you are looking at is one of the emergency hospitals that Connecticut built. This one was actually in New London uh, to handle the overflow of cases during the pandemic of 1918. This is uh, the reported cases of influenza from September to December 28th. It's public health department records. And you can see if you look down at the bottom, the, you know, just the hell on earth that October must have been for people trying to treat that disease. This is the, uh, the you know, initially they thought they were dealing with traditional old fashioned grip. So fighting the grip was the, uh, was the motto. They, when, when they realized it was Spanish influenza, uh, they ran ads and, you know, at first they're trying to downplay it. In this headline, you'll see the subhead says, nothing new, simply the old grip or la, or la grip that was epidemic in 1889 and 90. Only then it came from Russia, this time by way of Spain. Well, they knew that already they knew better than that. I mean, they knew that this wasn't the same old grip. This was a horrible and wretched disease, but they're just trying to keep people from panicking. Uh, you can see this is the Bridgeport Times, and once the disease took over, now you see, you know, the, the almost panicky cause for concern. Third headline down, epidemic scope increasing hourly. And over on the right, 51 new cases are reported making the total now 591. So uh, great concern in Bridgeport. And then it gets worse, 100,000 influenza cases in Connecticut. And you can see from the headline below, Pershing's men continue attacks. So the war is still going on. And then over in the left-hand side below that, grip totals of 983 reported in Bridgeport, 9 a.m. today. So they're monitoring and reporting. The increases are so fast that it's not by the day. Every edition of the paper is carrying a new, uh, a new number. This is where, I'll leave this up for a minute so you can look at it. These are where uh, the emergency influenza hospitals were. The triangles are where emergency hospitals were. The circles are where they didn't have a hospital, but they did send physicians and nurses to help deal with the people. So you can almost see, if you start looking over at New London, you can see the path that the disease followed through the state, up north into Lebanon, over towards Hartford, west toward New Britain, and then down to Fairfield County. Um, the exact, almost the exact opposite of the path COVID-19 took into Connecticut earlier this year. Here's the, uh, the list of how not to get the cold and how to get it. That's fresh air and sunshine, keep your mouth clean, et cetera, et cetera. And boy, they must have done a lot of spitting back then because they're always talking about not spitting. It must have been fun. Watch where you walk. Here is a case of Norwich, you know, they've, they've closed the schools for a week there. So they did this local option. When things got bad, they would shut down. They did the same thing with factories and companies too. 
instead of shutting down a whole town when there was a, a big outbreak in a particular place, they would close it. It is likely, although we, you know, this is all uh, armchair quarterbacking from a century later, it's likely that that was not very effective in halting the spread of the disease, but overall this approach was more effective in getting the kind of level of exposure to the disease and the immunities that would uh, lead to it becoming less virulent and less of an impact on the community. This is, as they saw the disease winding down, they wanted to warn people that, yeah, it's not as bad as it was, but it's not over yet. Influenza is sub sub subsiding, but danger still works. And if you look down at the bottom, that wonderful advice again, don't spit in public places, it spread disease. Go figure. Um, another year in influenza, this was their concern as they moved into 1919. This was on January 4th. Fortunately for everyone, though there was a surge at the beginning of the year, it was quickly tamped down and then the disease went away. So one of my, one of the really surprising things to me about the 1918 pandemic is how very few photographic representations there are of this disease and people handling it. That image of the New London Emergency Hospital is from a Library of Congress website and one of about a handful of a half dozen images that they have up from the pandemic. I, I am not sure why at a time when they're getting you know, excellent photography from World War I and on social and other historical events, they avoided capturing this photographically. But my suspicion is that the effects of this flu on people were so horrible that they just didn't capture it. What would happen, people who got this disease, in, in the worst cases, the ones who died from it, their lungs literally couldn't transfer air into them. They couldn't process air. So the people turned cyanotic, they turned blue. One of the phrases for the disease at the time was uh, the hellbore disease, because people's skin who were afflicted turned the color of the plant hellbore if you want to see what that's like and you don't know what hellbore looks like, you know, do a web search on it and see and imagine looking at people who are, who have, whose whole bodies have turned that color in a blotchy way and who are now uh, bleeding, you know, terribly from every orifice, which is what was happening. It was a wretched, wretched disease. And, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, COVID-19 is equally wretched for those who get the worst of it. But like, like COVID-19, the pandemic of 1918 went away and you know, we have better therapies now than we had then. We have a vaccine that apparently has an unbelievable 90% effectiveness and uh, we're learning how to live with it. If we just stay smart and stay careful for a while longer, we should all come out okay. So. That's my story. I have now told you everything I know about the pandemic of 1918. So I will now take your questions and make up the rest. Thanks, Walt, um, for your presentation and your um, candid discretion about the ability to answer questions. But I wanted to ask you all to continue to type the questions into the chat. If you do have questions, it's just easier to, to pass them along so we are not all speaking into the void at once. Um, and if I could, while, while you're gathering questions, can I take one second, and I don't know if you can see this, but this is my new book, Creating Connecticut. 24 stories about Connecticut history. It is, I just got an email today, the most amazing thing. It came from somebody named S. Claus at the North Pole. And it said, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, Dear Walt, read your book. This is the neatest Connecticut history I've read in ages. I am giving this to all the elves. So 
there, that's my pitch. I'm done. Available on Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. Um, check out the reviews. And if you, if you like Connecticut history or are interested in it, might be a good place to start. Now, back to the questions, Eric. The next spot is for Vicks VapoRub, by the way. <laughs> okay, so um, why do you suppose it went away relatively quickly, at least compared with COVID-19? I, you know, the speculation is that as uh, influenza viruses do, that it mutated into a less virulent form. That coupled with the likelihood of some degree of herd immunity um, is the, are the reasons they give for it. The, but no one knows for sure because they didn't even know at the time what kind of disease it was. Our, you know, it is, it is an amazing comment on how much, how far medicine has progressed in a century that we have been able to attack this pandemic the way we have compared to what they could do a hundred years ago. So we don't know, we speculate, and the best speculations are, little bit of herd immunity and a mutation of the virus. Um, next question is how involved were government officials in dispersing information about the influenza? Tremendously involved. They, they took all of these, well, many of these organizations that had been set up on an ad hoc basis to help handle the war effort. And in Connecticut, they shifted them over immediately into the war on the pandemic. So. There was, uh, there was a tremendous amount of government involvement, but it was not top-down controlled. Government provided knowledge and suggestions. It didn't tell local towns what to do. Towns got to decide. The, the state made recommendations about schools to keep them open, but every town could decide how they wanted to handle it. And that was pretty much their, their approach. Um, someone has asked, was there any use of masks back then? Yes. Um, in fact, there was an aggressive effort to get people to wear masks at some point. And I have some newspaper articles on the value of wearing masks and the importance of wearing masks. And uh, yeah, it, when, when I first started researching this, this was, it, I, I don't know if you remember way back at the dawn of time in February and March, there was a lot of question then about whether people should wear masks and it was a debate. It was not a settled deal. Well, I, I was surprised at the things I read, although it came later along in the pandemic, that there seemed to be universal agreement on wearing masks. Um, it seemed to me then that, you know, people in 1918 knew something that we didn't, we hadn't figured out yet. Well, now we figured it out and you know we still don't know it so who knows uh, um was the pandemic as bad in other parts of the country someone says my grandma and aunt got the flu in indiana it was it, predictably the flu was worse in cities and cities that didn't handle things well were worse than others the worst put the the city worst hit in the United States was Philadelphia. Philadelphia had a, Philadelphia was like New London, a big Navy town. Uh, and it was a big transfer port for, for soldiers going to war. So they had a large military population and a great urban population. And the mayor of Philadelphia, though he knew the pandemic was raging in the city, decided not to cancel a very big war bond parade, a parade to sell bonds for the war effort that brought thousands and thousands of people to downtown Philadelphia at exactly the wrong moment. So Philadelphia, because of that, experienced a, just a horrible impact. Uh, I read an article in the New York Times this weekend about the uh, the motorcycle week in Sturgis, South Dakota, where motorcyclists come from all over the country out there. And they, they came this summer and it was a point of pride that, you know, they weren't going to be cowed by masking and stuff like that. 
the New York Times is saying, although they didn't have specific evidence that I could see to support it, but they are saying that they think much of the national resurgence right now can be traced back to that week in Sturgis, South Dakota, where uh, hundreds of thousands of motorcyclists from all over the country came together for a week-long celebration and then uh, took asymptomatically the disease back home with them. It's a, you know, it's certainly a possibility, and but I guess we'll never know for sure. Um, good segue into the response to our current pandemic has been politicized and therefore many people are not wearing masks or social distancing. Was there a politics to the 1918 pandemic or were people more on the same page even if left up to those towns? It's a read between the lines thing. It, it certainly seems that there was an effort to get people to do their patriotic duty, and that's to act in correct ways to uh, fight the pandemic. But it's also clear from the reactions in the press and other people that a lot of people ignored it. Now, whether that was uh, that they just didn't want to do it, or that it was some kind of, you know, you're not going to, some kind of personal liberty statement, it certainly didn't it didn't appear in the press that it was uh, that it was political, but the country was at war, and you know it would be. It's kind of like those shy Trump voters. It probably wouldn't be smart to come out and say, "I'm not going to do the my the my patriotic duty right now." You just if you felt you know it was they were infringing on your personal liberty, you didn't do it. You spit in the street. Good for you. Um, I had a question that related. Um, you had mentioned uh, the response to the pandemic varied likely based on the location um, or varied widely based on location. What were yeah. some of those differences in the response? Well, at the, at the local level, people, people made decisions differently. When to close schools? Do you close schools? What do you do with churches? What do you, you, know, what do you tell people to do? When do you react? Uh, do you close down public meetings? Do you stop restaurants, public gatherings? All of those things were decisions made at the local level. You had lots of recommendations from state public health officials, but how it played out town to town was based on the town. Um, I also have a, a couple of people. So one person has said, um, would you like a copy of a family letter from 1919 about the pandemic? Oh, I absolutely would. That would be, that would be a treasure trove. Yeah. They say my dad was born on January 3rd, 1919 in New London. His great aunt on Long Island wrote his parents that she was sorry she wouldn't be able to visit. Um, somebody um, else says um, they have a photo of a large portrait of their grandmother who died in 1918 while working as a volunteer with the returning soldiers at the Red Cross in Buffalo. She had four children and an unborn fetus. My father was four years old, the youngest child of the family. Oh, I would love to see it. That, that, that makes me sad to read it, but yes, absolutely. If I could, let me, it, I, I'd like to give you my email address. I have the, I have the, easiest email address to remember of any of the 25,000 people who are connected with Yukon. It is walt at yukon.edu. U-C-O-N-N dot E-D-U. Simple as that. Walt at yukon.edu. And yes, please feel free. I would love to see these things. And um, if you have, you know, that those kinds of letters and that kind of, of photograph are exactly, they're exactly the kinds of things that we, we don't have, that historians don't have, because they were the everyday, you know, it, it was just day-to-day -day living. So yeah, that's a, that, I would love to see it, and I'm sure the State Library and other archives would also, you know, Connecticut Historical Society would love either have a copy or have the original if you were willing to part with it. I was gonna to say too, if you're comfortable sharing it to share with the other registrants on this um, program, I can pass it along by email. 
Um, oh, yeah. One more question somebody had asked, do you recommend any books, any book or books on it? Um, there are several. There's one, this is a little more general, but it's a, there's a new book, well, it's relatively new, it's about a year old. It's by a man named Mark Honigsbaum, H-O-N-I-G-S-B-A-U-M. And it is called The Pandemic Century. Now, it talks about the pandemic of 1918, but it also talks about Ebola and AIDS and all of the, the you know, he, his argument is that the 20th century was a century of pandemics. And I think that book is really helpful because in many ways it gives us a longer view of what happens when these sudden diseases crop up. So I would recommend that. On the, on the pandemic in Connecticut, I, there's, there's very little. There, I, there's one, I know of one journal article that was published 10 or 15 years ago, and that's pretty much it. The, I relied on the health department reports from 1921 and uh, newspaper accounts. They were, you know, they were, they were quite helpful. Um, someone else mentioned John Barry and Nancy Bristow both have written excellent books about the 1918 flu pandemic in the U.S., not specific to Connecticut. I, I read John Barry's book. I can't remember the title of it, but if you, would, if you would type the titles, I think that would be good to have, and thank you. That's Lori, Lori Lynn Price. Thanks much. Um, I believe I missed one in transit here. Oh, someone... Um, Another anecdote, my grandfather traveled from Spain to Argentina during 1918. He used to tell me stories that as he knew how to write, um, many individuals in the boat would ask him to write letters to their loved ones in the boat. Oh, how cool. How cool. You know, uh, for all of you who have those stories, this is something, as a state historian, this is, I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit. Those of us who have had the good fortune to live long and interesting lives or lives you may or may not think are interesting, we are treasure troves of information for children, grandchildren, and people we've never met or will never meet who want to know what our world was like. If you have never thought of doing it, you know, you owe it to your family or just to the world at large to sit down and write a memoir that tells the stories you know that you're talking about right now. These are, this is the stuff of history and there's not enough of it out there that historians can get to the real meat of what life was like for the people who lived through it. So, and the only way that people will have it is if we shy people who don't think of ourselves as writers decide the stories are more important than the artistry and we just sit down and write it. If, you, if you'll take the time to do that, make that somebody's Christmas present. Tell them a story from your past and you'll be surprised how you'll feel about it and how they'll feel about it. End of the second commercial. The next one is Vicks VapoRub. I want to build on your first commercial and say anybody who wants to do that work should come to the library's writing group the first and third Wednesday at 6 p.m. I'll take that second. Wonderful idea. And I really, really, I hope, I hope some of the people here will, will pick up on that. Um, let's see, an, another... Oh, the Lori two books, Lentheis. by the way, John Barry's book, yes, The Great Influenza, and Nancy Bristow is called American Pandemic. I'll send those in a follow-up email. Excellent. Um, so, so Lori Lynn Price, I have been collecting stories about the 1918 flu pandemic and solely posting them to my blog to keep the stories alive. I hope it's okay to post here. It certainly is. You can see it at 1918flustories.com, and I'm happy to add your family's story. I agree that storytelling and sharing is so important. Oh, and I'll that put is... that, that website in the follow-up email as well. Thank you. Well, I'm going to... I'm. I'm opening up sticky notes right now, 1918 flu stories. Thank you so much. 
and then we're closing in on um, seven o'clock. So does anybody have some, some last questions for, well, oh, someone asked the story group. I'll, fo I'll follow up, I'll, I'll add a link. It's a book writing group. Um, we meet twice a month. Any other questions about Walt's talk though? Let me just thank everyone for coming. I, I genuinely appreciate your taking time either out of your dinner hour or of your cocktail hour to come listen to me. So um, I know both of those are precious moments. So I was very happy that you came and uh, grateful to talk with you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Walt, for, for this and also your humor. It's very much appreciated. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. And everyone stay safe. I know we're, we're sick and tired of this, but it ain't over yet. It's just on its way out. So be well.